about today, it's more about a, a partnership working with various people. So I'll do some introductions about people who are here. We've got Chris Morley, who is a lay member for uh, the CCG, which is the Clinical Commissioning Group. He also sits on the Patient and Public Advisory Group uh, for the Kenton Medway Group. Um, we have from KCC, we have Joe Fraser, who leads on adult social care transformation projects for the Kent County Council, and Julia Fraser from Public Health. Uh, if people are interested in discussing more about the prevention aspect of things as we go down the slides, uh, Julia, Ju uh, Julia will be talking about that on that table. We have from the mental health team, we have Dr. Ahmed Ismail. Uh, we are expecting uh, Ivan McConnell to come as well and Kelly August. So if you want to discuss about the mental health aspect of things, that's the table to go to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, from the hospital trust, we have Dr. David Hargrose, who will be talking about and going through the slides about the hospital work, work program. We are also expecting Matthew Kershaw to come later on towards, towards, this, towards this afternoon. We also have members from the social care team and from the local council and voluntary sectors. Um, we have staff from the CCGs who will be present at the table, so when we're going to the group discussion at the table, we will hope that uh, that is all encapsulated during the con when you're having the discussion and when you're putting your input in. <coughs> uh, the format for today, it is a listening event, which is uh, not a formal consultation. The difference being that there are no plans that are formalized. So it is not about formalized plans that we need an input. It's an input a process before that. We, it's an event that follows on from an event that happened about eight months ago uh, down the road at uh, the Julie Rose Stadium. We couldn't get there today because the roads are all closed. Uh, but this, this is the follow-up event to touch base with what we've thought of from what we've heard last time and how do we take it forward from there onwards. We, the commissioning bodies are the, are the people who, are, who will be involved with the planning of the services. So I am Dr. Naveen Gupta, I am a GP down the road at Wilkesboro Health Centre and I am the clinical chair of the clinical commissioning group. So there were four CCGs, the four clinical commissioning group in East Kent, the uh, commissioning group for Kent and Medway will all come together in making sure that whatever we have, having to, we have heard in the listening event is discussed and put down in the final plans which again will be going through the formal consultation, which will take place sometime next year. But the emphasis today is about listening. We want to listen to people. We want to make sure that we've heard people's voices so that that is incorporated in the plan. However, before we do the listening bit, we want to touch base with what has been already discussed so that you have a, you know, you have a view of what's been, what you said before and where we are at this particular moment in our journey. The way to contribute, that, there are various ways. So after the initial bit, there will be group, you can have a discussion at the table. There's the talking, they can put post-its on the poster there. We also have a newspaper on the table that will tell us, that will give you information of where things are in the various things that are happening for the health and social care sector. It will also tell about a questionnaire that you can fill up. And all the slides from today will be on the website from tomorrow. I'll quickly go through the challenges because these are the slides that have been presented before. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on the challenges because it's been discussed before. I would rather go down to the listening part of it more quickly. But the, poor cha the challenges remain the same, which is the population is growing. People are having more long-term conditions, increased number of mental health, and the number of people over the age of 80 will, is predicted to rise. We also know that the challenges involve that as many as 4 in 10 emergency hospitals can be avoided if the right care is provided at the right place at the right time by the right people. And we know that there are people in the hospital bed who do not no longer lead a hospital bed but can be cared for outside. The challenges remain about workforce in terms of recruiting GPs, nurses, 
on the ground so as to deliver the care that is required. Hopefully people have seen this model before because it was discussed earlier and this is something that has been discussed in previous listening events. Basically it's an inverted triangle in which the focus remains on prevention and the focus is on a local care aspect. That means we want to help people to remain well and give them information so that they can remain well and look after their own health. When they do need help, the care is more local to them and the hospital is used only for services that are actually for a hospital setting. These are the various events that have taken place so far. So in, there has been a lot of feedback that we've had from patients that have a lot of feedback that we had from carers which has helped us frame where we are today. Touching quickly on the prevention aspect of things, this is mainly to improve health, use every contact to help. Smoking is a priority because smoking has a lot of impact on other aspects of healthcare. It is to help everybody live well with the health condition. If there is a pro health condition that flares up, what do you do with it? And it basically is a, is a way to make sure that people remain healthy as long as possible, and which, is the, which is the primary aspect of things. And the secondary, if they have a condition, to maintain a good health in spite of that long-term condition so as to avoid a crisis situation from happening. As mentioned earlier, people who are interested in this aspect uh, welcome to join the prevention table in the discussion group. I'm going to touch more on the local care aspect of things. By local, I mean care that is not in the hospital. It is an outside the hospital setting care, closer to people's home. And this is what people have said to us about local care before. There was emphasis on end of life, dementia care, support with healthy lifestyle, services along general practice, services closer to people's home, support for carers. They want to see the same, so continuity was a very, was a very important part in, in the local care. And faster and easier appointments. These have been the concerns. Not enough staff, having to travel to far and for the services, mental health services, social care, and funding aspect of things were the concerns that were highlighted. An emphasis was made that when there is a crisis, people are not there to respond, there's duplication, and therefore that causes confusion, which in turn results in the crisis getting much worse. Having listened to that, this, these are our local aims, our aims for the local care. Prevention, excellent care to home, allowing people to look after themselves when diagnosed with a condition and intervening early before people need to go to the hospital. I'll hand it over to Joe to talk about the social aspect of things for the moment. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk through what social care is doing in terms of transforming our services, very much in line with the model that you saw um, and delivering the local care aims. Um, for the past year, we've um, since we developed our strategy, Your Life, Your Wellbeing, which is, um, if you've not seen it, it's available on our website or I can arrange to have a copy provided to you. Um, we've been developing three key themes around promoting well-being, promoting independence and supporting independence. And there's a number of things I'd like to touch on in those areas in terms of what that means for you. Essentially, it's about better care coordination and joining up our service delivery. So we really focus on the outcomes that are important to individuals. The vision that is within the strategy is to help people to improve and maintain their well-being and to live as independently as possible. So to do that, in the first area, you can see promoting your well-being. It's very much about keeping people in their communities. So working in partnership with the voluntary and community sector to develop services that are local to you, that prevent social isolation, 
And um, in particular, one of the specific things we're doing is some of you may have heard of the Care Navigator scheme. We're looking at expanding that, developing that, and creating promoting well-being coordinators who will work with individuals within their local communities, really getting to understand what's available and pointing you in the right direction to where, um, I'm trying to think of some examples now, where um, local groups are, things you can get involved in that really maintain that um, engagement and involvement in your community. It's also about making sure you have better access to the information and guidance that you need. So if you need to, you can do more things yourself at home, accessing through the website or in your local community centre, libraries, etc. Um, we know that there's a, a, an improvement there to be made in terms of the type of information that you need and how you access that. In terms of promoting independence, that's more about our sort of short-term interventions. So that's where you may need a bit more um, support um, and very much so that's about working in partnership with health in terms of developing an integrated rehabilitation scheme that looks at um, your requirements for care, is more enabling and reduces that duplication that you sometimes feel in terms of activity. So focusing on what needs to happen for you to prevent hospital admission and also improve hospital discharge. That may involve equipment, telecare, the kind of um, devices that ensure that when you're living at home, you have access to um, support um, through lifelines, those kind of things, but also exploring what else is available to maintain that independence for you. It's also about looking at our workforce in that, so making sure we've got the right um, skills, how we use trusted assessors, so other people, it doesn't always have to be someone from social care, we can work again with the voluntary and community sector for how we have an improved workforce to enable some of these things to happen. Promoting independence, sorry I've just touched that, that haven't I? Did I mention self-assessment? Making sure I took that off, no. So in terms of um, self-assessment, we want to implement and develop um, your own self-assessment tool, in essence. So at the moment, somebody might come to your home, deliver an assessment, but actually, there's no reason that you couldn't do that yourself, at home, using a computer, or if you need assistance to do that, through the telephone or someone coming out, then that's still possible. But actually putting in self-assessment so you can really start to do things yourself when you need it, as opposed to always waiting on services and sometimes the timetable that doesn't kind of fit with yours. You may have all spotted the deliberate mistake in that I'm not talking through the detail that's on the slide because that is a list of services and I think it's better to try and give you some practical examples of actually what it means but if anyone has any questions about the services I can, I can do my best to try and answer those. So don't worry if you think what I'm saying isn't reflected on the slide. It is, but it's, it's just in, that's obviously um, as I say, more of the actual delivery models as opposed to what, what you might need to know in terms of what it means. The supporting independence part, so that is very much the joined up team for health and care. That is about the right support at the right time. So what we need to do in order to enable you to keep well and living in your own home. This very much is, a, is about the model of care to change, to be much more enabling and outcome based. So thinking about what outcomes you need, what outcomes you want to achieve, and actually working with care providers to incentivise them to deliver those outcomes for you. So again, not that kind of, you may have heard the phrase time and tasks, they're not about actually someone coming in at a certain time and doing a, a certain number of tasks, but actually thinking about what it is you want to achieve in terms of your own personal outcomes based on what you can already do, so where you are in terms of your own independence, the activities um, that you can already do for yourself, so we can help maintain and improve that level of independence. Absolutely though, it's about working together, so making sure, as has been said, that the different kinds of support work well together. So if you need nursing care or, and social care, how do we connect and how do we bring in that specialist support as well as required? And also then, in terms of, if you, if you do find yourself in hospital, what's the best way and most efficient way of in, ensuring that you can get back to your own bed 
because we all that's what we believe, own bed is best. So how do we work in, ter in terms of a joint discharge, returning you home with the right support so you have that in your own home? I'm going to touch upon what does local care actually mean on a, on a patient level. We've used two of these care as an example, but I'm going to reflect back onto a patient I saw about two years ago because this journey has been going on for our last two years really. We've been going through this patient. A patient of mine who, who basically was about 78 years of age, lived with her husband, very similar to Dorothy, who had heart failure, who had uh, asthma, which uh, was called asthma, but I thought it was, it's more of a chronic obstructive disease, had early onset of dementia, uh, quite a frail lady who was living at home, but pretty independent because the main carer who was the husband was doing a fantastic job to looking after after after, Dor uh, after Dorothy. I'm calling her Dorothy at the moment in time. Um, basically, what was happening was the she had a crisis. She had a urine infection. Went into the hospital. Came back out of the hospital pretty promptly. But after she came back out of the hospital, she then ended up having various people coming into her her through the front door. I got a call from the husband saying, I'm not entirely sure which medications I am required to give for Dorothy. I'm not entirely sure who's coming in through the front door. Could you come and have could you come and visit her and go through that? So I went there and had a chat with, and, and and not unsurprisingly you had various team of people coming in from both the health and social care sector. You had a district nurse coming in to do a blood test, then you had a cardiac nurse to come in because she had heart failure. She then had somebody else coming in to make sure that she had all the gear that is required so that she can be as independent and health that is required. So all with the right intentions, but all coming at a different time and introducing them, uh, introducing slightly differently, confusing the whole picture for, for the husband and more importantly for Dorothy. She was not entirely sure what was happening. Unfortunately, husband became unwell and they, and with, uh, with a heart condition and was admitted again. This produced another crisis situation in the home. Unfortunately, that meant that she was unable to look after herself because she was not aware, even though she was, her dementia wasn't too bad, she didn't know how to look after herself at all because it was looked after by the husband and even, even though there were people coming in, there was no coordination and there was no clear information for her to look after herself and therefore she basically was so much uh, in, in an anxious situation that she developed a flare-up of her conditions. She had another urine infection, she had then had a chest infection which required admission and unfortunately that admission wasn't successfully, she was unable to, she wasn't able to successfully manage that condition which meant she died in the hospital. Now this is a condition who, this could have changed, this definitely could have changed for, for my patient and it definitely could have changed for her so that she didn't have to go through all those processes and all the confusion and anxiety uh, that she faced with at, at home. What we are hoping to do is try and avoid that. We are trying to avoid all of that from happening so that we have a consistent and an organized system. We talk as one unit rather than individuals from different organizations. It's important to introduce that but I think it needs to be in the context for the patient really rather than context for the organization. It needs to be simple to access. I think one of the main problems with uh, the access at that particular moment was calling up the GP and therefore having to wait for a phone call which took a long time and therefore ended up with the crisis getting worse. So primary care access, access to the coordinator is quite important. It needs to be assessed by the right person at the right place at the right time. So that's quite important that the person has that ability to do that. So that's our ambition for that particular patient in, the, in now, going forward, needs to be able to organize her care better. She is able to, or her carer is able to interpret things, things better. Home as soon as possible so that uh, there, is a, there is a system at home to look after her and manage and support the carer as well as soon as possible. It's easier for the person to get in terms of access for the care that is required. So not multiple numbers given by multiple people who come with different colored uniforms, uh, with different tabards around their neck of different colors. It, it just causes a very confusing picture for that person who's receiving 
a good but a fragmented care and therefore feels I'm not entirely sure what's happening in this situation. The visit at home needs to be prompt it, and there are systems going around in Kent at the moment that are pioneering things like paramedic practitioners that are looking into this aspect so that you can get a visit by a person much quicker than in, in, in the local setting than it's been done in the past. The, the team needs to come as one rather than individuals. It, it needs to work as one. And make, that, and make sure that she can maintain her independence, the person can maintain her independence, his or her independence to the best of her, his or her ability, with the support of loved ones if required, but that is, that is paramount really. In Ashford, what we are hoping to do is to work around general practice settings. So all the general practice, all the GPs, including myself, we are individual businesses, we are individual units. We have, however, acknowledged that there's no point working in that fashion because it just helps in the fragmentation of the NHS for a patient to deliver a complex care if required. We need to work together. Why do we need to work together? I was, I was at the hospital uh, AGM about, about a year or two years ago and one of the questions that was asked by, by a Canterbury patient uh, was, I, I wasn't aware that it, I could get an uh, injection for a hip problem in the GP because my GP wouldn't do it or couldn't do it. But a neighboring GP can. Can it not be possible for me to go to the neighboring GP? It, currently, it's possible in Ashford. And in Canterbury as well as possible. At that moment, it wasn't, but we moved on from that. So people can achieve the same service across Ashford for certain conditions by GPs working together, primary care working together. It's not just about GPs, it's about other services as well. So it's about nursing services working together with primary care, specialist GPs. We have spare GPs who are specialists in various fields like cardiology and diabetes, like ENT. We can utilize their expertise so as to help patients get the care closer to home, which is local care. We can get specialists out into the community, like community geriatricians or care of the elderly clinicians who come out and help GPs because they have a better and a more specific expertise on certain conditions which will help support primary care as well as the primary community care team to deliver a better care closer to home. And more importantly, it's about joining up the health and social care team. It's about linking in with the voluntary sector because the social care team, the voluntary sector, play an important part in the care for our patients. And we want to make sure that the whole unit comes across as one for our patients. We have an improved access to minor injury service, so people can call up different GP surgeries in Nashford and can get minor injury service without having to go to a &E. They can be assessed there, and if obviously accident and emergency is required, then they can be sent over or with the right advice. So we are not going to work as, we're going to work as one unit for certain things, but Willsborough Health Centre, which is where I'm working at, at the moment, will also be working under the Ashford Urban Patch. This is with other practices like Sydney House, Kings North, South Ashford Medic, Singleton Medical Centre and Singleton Surgery. Similarly, we order, or we'll have a rural patch, which is Charing Surgery, Ham Street, Ivy Court, and Woodchurch. The rural patch have done magnificently in, take, in looking at something called as a virtual ward. So they have patients who are elderly patients who they all come together and to deal with that team together. So if there are any patients from 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 those surgeries, they may they might be aware of the, how the system works, which is basically they come together, have a team working together and they have a specific care coordinator who has a list of patients who are, ex who are frail, who need regular input and therefore this co coordinator contacts the person on a regular basis. If there is a crisis, those people have the number to the coordinator who can give advice or inform other people as need arises. The other hub that is working also is the Ashford North which consists of Y, New His Bank Surgery, Hollington and Selin Surgery. We talked about the specialist, GP specialist, New His Bank has got an eye clinic, Selin has got an ENT clinic running, 
which not, not only takes care of patients from that hub, but across the whole of Ashford. Similarly, there are clinics in Kings North Medical Practice and Sydenham House as well. This is how we are hoping to work in, in the local care model. So the future of local care consists of self-care, so people have better tools. They have simple ways to access service. Those who require that more, more quick service in, in terms of crisis have got a care coordinator linked to them so that they can help people get through that particular crisis. The care is joined up across NHS, social care and voluntary sector, and it is local, which we hope will have fewer hospital crisis visits and the visits are only absolutely if they require them. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. David Hargroves to talk about the hospital aspect of things and then we'll go down to the question aspect.